Guys, welcome to the program. Thank you kindly for joining us. This is the Tuesday edition of the I Love Seville show. Um, I am responding to comments coming in here left and right. Thank you kindly for joining us. We're live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville network. We're presented by Skuma Boutique Dispensary in the Charlottesville downtown mall. Skuma Boutique Dispensary. David and his team have certificates of analyses for everything in the store. Tink Fiber Internet, the crazy fast internet behind the I Love Seville network. Dr. Scott Wagner of Scott Wagner Integrated of medicine, a proud partner of this program, and the family and interstate pest and service companies, thank you kindly for being partners of ours for nearly 10 years. Um, a lot we're going to cover. Folks, at 3 o'clock today, we have a closed-door session with five city councilors. We'll offer you our insider perspective on what's going to transpire this afternoon at 3 o'clock. If you watch Real Talk, Keith Smith show earlier today, you saw some of the best programming we have ever aired on the I Love Seville Network, and you got a taste of what's going to happen this afternoon. I'm going to analyze today on the program the timeline of events, the flipbook of what transpired that has led us to a closed-door session with city councilors, with the city manager, his career, and his future, the topic of conversation. We will also talk about 65 acres in Greene County that just sold for $4.5 million. 49,000 square feet of commercial real estate that just went under contract in the 323 building across from Friendship Court. And folks, WTI crude, long story short, gasoline, barrels of oil have doubled in price year over year. If you're pumping gas into your vehicle right now, you see gasoline is somewhere in the neighborhood of 315 to 330 a gallon. That ain't cheap. And get ready, giddy up. The prices are going to escalate even more. The lead of today's show, undoubtedly, city hall and local government. I'm going to give you facts, facts, and nothing but the facts today on the I Love Seville show. At 3 o'clock today, a closed-door session, Lloyd Snook, Cena McGill, Michael Payne, Heather Hill, and Nakia Walker. The topic, the city manager. Mr. Chip Boyles, you watch this program. So do you, city councilors. I want to start with this. I have respect for Chip. I think he is a man of integrity and a man who genuinely, genuinely, genuinely is trying to do the right things. I think some of the decisions he has made over the last 30 days have been, to use his words, hasty, rash, and to use my words, perhaps not the most well thought out. Here's the timeline and flipbook of events. Dr. Richardson, a city manager that city council recruited, left Dodge and peaced out of the city of Charlottesville. Could not get along with city council. Dr. Richardson's replacement was a friend of the program, and John Blair. John Blair, the Charlottesville city attorney who assumed the responsibilities of interim city manager. John Blair immediately realized that Charlottesville local government was even more of a fiasco than he anticipated as city attorney. John Blair said, this is enough. I'm going to leave Charlottesville, despite living in the south side of Charlottesville with his beautiful wife and intelligent son, and he has since taken a job as the city attorney of Stanton. Stanton's a lovely town, a charming town. This left Heather Hill, Lloyd Snook, Cena McGill, Michael Payne, and Nakia Walker in a very sticky and tricky position. They immediately turned 
to the Thomas Jefferson District Planning Commission and recruited Mr. Chip Boyles to an interim city manager post. Mr. Chip Boyles was hailed and accoladed as an individual and gentleman who could stabilize an organization that was tumultuous, that embodied turmoil and dysfunction. For most of Mr. Chip Boyles' tenure, stability started coming to local government and city hall. We saw positions being filled. We saw government getting along. We saw the squabbles, the beefs, and the argumentative nature that without question proliferated city council meetings start to quiet and disappear. Then the last 30 days hit. And in the last 30 days, we watched absolute implosion of local government. This implosion of local government started within the police department of Charlottesville, Virginia. Chief Brackney was fired, unceremoniously fired, fired in surprising fashion, fired in quick fashion. Some say the Police Benevolent Association had tremendous influence in this firing. Surveys conducted by the PBA led to the termination of Chief Brackney. Others say that Chief Brackney had lost the confidence of rank and file officers. Others say even more that rank and file officers were sprinting for other police departments to the point where the police department in Charlottesville was going to be a skeleton crew of a department. Chip Boyles was left with a decision to make. In hindsight, in retrospect, I think Mr. Boyles would have handled the decision differently. Regardless, he fired the police chief, Chief Brackney. As he fired the police chief, he did so in very quick and hasty fashion. In fact, some of the counselors didn't even know this termination was going to happen. Now, to Chip Boyles' credit, he has the autonomy to fire people that work for Charlottesville government. That's what the city manager is able to do. That's the autonomy our government provides the CEO of this municipality. So Chip, he decided a little less than a month ago to make the decision to terminate the police chief to keep collateral damage in check, to minimize the damage of rank and file officers quitting at rapid pace. When he fired the police chief, immediately the activist community galvanized against him. And that was the start of a very difficult 30-day period for Mr. Chip Boyles. Mr. Boyles responded to this activist community by writing an op-ed, an editorial for, within the Charlottesville Daily Progress. This editorial explained his perspective on terminating the police chief. As the editorial reached the print edition and the digital edition of Charlottesville's daily newspaper, people were left scratching their heads, wondering why the CEO of the city was writing commentary for the daily newspaper, as opposed to keeping his perspective on why he fired the police chief to himself. This commentary, this op-ed, was not very well received. This commentary, this op-ed, this perspective on why Mr. Boyles fired the police chief 
only added proverbial fuel to the fire with the activist community in Charlottesville. We now, we now find out that this op-ed, this commentary that was published in the newspaper, was done in conjunction with the PR firm from Washington, D.C. Mr. Boyles uses personal Gmail account to connect with this PR firm in DC. Through many FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Acts, an attorney in this community, Janice Redinger, has shared what she has discovered through FOIA on social media. Quickly, what she has discovered has gone viral and gained steam and momentum. These FOIAs include text message exchanges with Mr. Bellamy Brown and Counselor Heather Hill. These FOIAs include email exchanges with Mr. Chip Boyles and the DCPR firm that helped craft and guide the editorial that showed and printed in the Daily Progress on why Mr. Boyles fired Chief Brackney. These FOIAs show a local government that frankly is not operating in an efficient manner. Furthermore, the mayor of Charlottesville Nakia Walker, in the last city council meeting last week, she secretly recorded a conversation between herself and Mr. Chip Boyles. She then utilized that secret conversation and played it back during a city council meeting, the one that just transpired. She utilized this secret recording to make Mr. Boyles look bad. She utilized the secret recording to extort Mr. Boyles. She utilized the secret recording to tarnish the career, reputation, and image of the city manager. I'd like to take an aerial view or a macro perspective on this. When John Blair quit as interim city manager to take the city attorney position in Stanton, four counselors, Heather Hill, Lloyd Snook, Michael Payne, and Cena McGill, quickly chose amongst them Mr. Boyles as the city manager. Nakia Walker was very much not a part of that decision. Because Nakia Walker was not a part of that decision, she has undoubtedly had it in for Mr. Boyles. She, without question, wanted to be a part of the decision making for city manager. And to her credit, who could blame the mayor for wanting to be a part of the city manager selection. She felt backdoored by her fellow counselors who picked Mr. Boyles as interim city manager. And because she felt backdoored, she has always had a chip, a grievance, an issue with Mr. Boyles. We have seen that chip that grievance, that issue, manifest itself and gain momentum in city council meetings. And that chip, that grievance, that issue, crescendoed in this past city council meeting where she aired secret recordings of Mr. Boyles talking about the Police Benevolent Association, talking about Chief Brackney, 
and airing other dirty laundry that otherwise should stay in-house. Today, we are left with the following. We have a police chief position that has been in an interim role handed to Tito Durrett. He is the interim, interim police chief. Major Jim Moody announced his resignation for the second time this past Friday. He first announced his resignation days before Chief Brackney was fired. Then Chip Boyles persuaded Jim Mooney to come back to the job to help with the transition as counsel and as Mr. Boyles searched nationally for a new police chief. In surprising fashion, this past Friday, Major Jim Moody retired permanently for the second time. Mr. Boyles, with his back against the wall once again, promoted Tito Durrett to the interim, interim police chief position. Furthermore, we expect in two hours and seven minutes in a closed door session that council will either pink slip or receive the resignation of Mr. Chip Boyles. This will leave local government with an interim, interim, interim city manager. I believe that Maurice Jones, former city manager, is still being paid by local government. Dr. Richardson, still being paid by local government. John Blair, still being paid by local government. Mike Murphy, still being paid by local government. And now potentially, Chip Boyles, still being paid by local government. This should matter to you. How these men are compensated is through tax dollars, our money, the money we bust our tails to generate through businesses, through the meals tax, the lodging tax, cigarette tax, retail tax, real estate tax. It is our money that is the foundation for a $200 million plus city budget. We have as much skin in the game as five counselors and as the city manager does. So, in conclusion, the soap opera that is local government. We have a city manager position that, frankly speaking, will not attract the most qualified candidates. If you're a talented up-and-coming city manager, or if you're a city manager that currently has experience, why in the Lord's name would you take this job? Why? If you're a police chief, experienced in another municipality, or an up-and-coming officer from a different municipality, why would you come to Charlottesville and be the police chief? Al Thomas, he had a cup of coffee as the police chief in Charlottesville. Chief Brackney, look at what happened to her. Two of the most important positions in local government in our town are city manager, CEO of the city, and police chief, CEO of the police department. Both positions, the expectation at 3 o'clock today, will be open. On November 2nd, two spots on council are open and up for grabs. Heather Hill, who's not running for re-election, and Nakia Walker, who chose to run for re-election and then recently said, I'm withdrawing my name from the ballot. Neil Williamson, the president of uh, Free Enterprise Forum, has said many times, elections matter. And boys and girls, they most certainly do. They most certainly do. 
I miss the days of being a Charlottesville business owner and not hearing about local government every single day. Mr. Brian Pinkston said something to me while sitting on this set of the Isle of Seville Network. Mr. Brian Pinkston is a candidate for city council. He said, I want to be the counselor that no one knows his name. That's resonated with me. Often in sports, you have referees that think they are a part of the game. They make decisions and calls at crunch time that determine the outcome of the contest. That's not how sports should be played. The athletes should determine the winners and the losers. I make that analogy because today we have counselors, one in particular, that feel they are the story as opposed to the municipality they represent being the story. Charlottesville has so much beauty and good. Let's let the beauty and the good and the people and the community sing the praises of the brand we call Charlottesville and not individual politicians who choose on some mornings to write graphic poetry, who choose on other days to secretly record city managers, who choose on some evenings to bicker, argue, and humiliate their colleagues on the dais, and who choose on other afternoons to speak to the world's newspaper about our community being ugly to the soul. That is not a champion of Charlottesville. That, my friends, is the definition of divisive. We will see what happens this afternoon. I have never, in my 21 years of living in this community, first as a first year in old dorms, Dabney 101, right next to Bonnie Castle, in Bonnie Castle Circle, to this day of October 12th, 2021, seen such dysfunction with an organization. I'm fed up, I'm frustrated, I'm demoralized, I'm depressed, and disgusted. couple more items out of the notebook. Who is going to be the interim, interim, interim city manager? Two names come to mind. Mike Murphy, who's already had experience as an interim city manager. I believe he works for SNL right now. And Dave Norris, former mayor of Charlottesville. Mike Murphy and Dave Norris. If I'm counsel, I'm backdooring with those two men to see if they have any interest in being the interim, interim, interim city manager. The next question is whether Tito Durat should get the role of full-time police chief. He was the youngest police officer hired in Charlottesville Police Department history. A man who as a teenager started working for the department. Tito Durrett, respected by many in this community. I think he should be a front runner, Tito Durrett, for police chief in the city of Charlottesville. Two other topics, excuse me, three other topics, and then we get to Alex Erpe, CEO of Emergent Financial Services. Jenny Stoner and Johnny Pritzloff of Tolheimer helped make a deal happen in Greene County we talked about this on Real Talk this morning after Neil Williamson shared the link in the feed. 65 acres in Greene County just sold for $4,550,000. An LLC, Merritt Green LLC, 
purchased the 65 acres. Their intent is to utilize the acreage for a mixed use development. This 65 acres is just south of the sheets in green. The dysfunction, the despair, and the disorganization of local government in the city of Charlottesville is undoubtedly driving tailwinds and momentum to the municipalities and jurisdictions adjacent to the city. Business owners, developers, entrepreneurs, and visionaries alike are fed up and frustrated just like me with local government in a 10.2 mile square city and are hitting the road, Jack, for counties like Green, Fluvanna, Louisa, Orange, Nelson, and Green, where they are choosing to open their pocketbooks to create their business opportunities and ventures. This is a perfect example. 65 acres in Green County, 4,555,000 mixed use development. Two other topics out of the notebook. Again, this one from Tallheimer and Johnny Pritzloff. The 323 building, which is right across the street from Friendship Court, Garrett Square in downtown Charlottesville, has a new tenant, General Atomics. They are leasing 49,257 square feet of office space. That is a huge chunk of Class A office space. The building in totality is 120,000 square feet. 120,000 square feet. 49,257 square feet of that 120K are going to one business, General Atomics, Com Commonwealth Computer Research. I bring this to your attention because this deal will undoubtedly drive the Charlottesville economy, pinch the Charlottesville housing market. These high paid individuals, high net worth individuals, well salaried and well healed individuals that will work for General Atomics Commonwealth Computer Research in the city of Charlottesville will purchase the little real estate inventory available in our fair city, further expediting gentrification, further expediting the cost of living, further driving up the cost of buying a house in Charlottesville and Central Virginia. I give props and kudos to General Atomics Commonwealth Computer Research for choosing Charlottesville. I'm excited to have these individuals in the downtown mall driving our local economy. I find it to be promising and full of potential, but undoubtedly expediting gentrification in our community. And lastly, as we get Alex Erpe on set here of the I Love Seville show, opposite me on this boardroom table, with Judah framing him in the, in the position. WTI crude, we'll cut to the chase, gasoline. Yesterday, doubled in price versus pandemic lows. Gasoline undoubtedly will flirt with four bucks a gallon very, very soon. Yesterday, I filled up a 2020 Ford Explorer, and it cost me north of $50 to do. That's a hell of a lot of money to get around town. When gasoline prices go up, and boys and girls, they're going up pretty damn quickly, that undoubtedly will drive up prices in every sector of business, in every space of business. Gallon of milk, loaf of bread, cost of lumber to build homes, apparel companies, uniform companies, advertising agencies, restaurants, retail. Gasoline is a part of every business in America. And if we flirt with four bucks a gallon, which we will in Q4, get ready for that word we've discussed 
quite a bit this year, inflation. Judah Wickhauer, studio camera, please, and let's welcome Alex Erpe, Chief Executive Officer of Emergent Financial Services to the show. Good afternoon, my friend. Good afternoon, Jerry. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Um, anywhere you want to go in any topic we've talked, certainly in two hours, frankly, in an hour and 53 minutes, everyone in Charlottesville is on the edge of their seat for what council and the city manager um, will do with the now, we expect, interim, interim, interim city manager position. It's just, it, it's time to say it even from a monetary perspective, just in the sense of you would think that by four or five, we would maybe structure the deals a little differently so that we don't continue to pay people after they're done from short, which is, I think you, what would this be now, five that we'll be paying? You got us. Maurice Jones, Dr. Terrian Richardson, mm -hmm. you got Mike Murphy, you got John Blair, you got Chip Boyles, that's five, and whoever and replaces we'll Mr. Boyles. Six. So, I mean, if this was the New York Yankees or like a sports team, you'd be sitting there and saying, why do you keep promising your, your managers to pay out these large contracts even after they're done? It's just, it's, it's a sad, but it's a shame because it, it's, it's a use of money that the taxpayers have paid that could be used for other things, frankly. I mean, it's, it's not as though Charlottesville City has so much revenue coming in, especially given what happened last year, that we can afford to be spending money on individuals who aren't doing anything for us at this point. I mean, maybe they did, but they're not doing it currently, and we're continuing to, pay the, to have to pay them because of the fact that we keep making either poor choices or going back on choices that we've made. It's hard to tell at this point with, the, with number, going on number six. But it's, I just looked at that, and from my financial advisor perspective, I'm saying money spent there is money that could have been used to probably a greater effect somewhere else in city government. Incentivize entrepreneurs create um, PPP or to offer PPP during a pandemic, mm -hmm. um, creating branding, marketing, and advertising campaigns to drive regional tourism to our municipality, um, further incentivizing a nonprofit that means a lot to you, CIC. CIC, I mean, there is a business equity fund coming out of the city, and that could have been increased with some of the money that was that is continued to be paid out. So it's, a, it's just a shame. There's other uses that we know that are better for that money than having to continually pay people who are no longer even on the roster. What do you think this impact will have on Main Street, the proverbial Main Street, in Charlottesville and Central Virginia? It's tough to say. I, I wonder if we've almost reached the point of desensitization to it. In other words, I mean, in my memory, like since I've been doing business, I think this is five, all five of those city managers. I started doing business 2014. So I think all five have passed. And certainly in the last, for as far as I can remember, I, I don't think any of the last three city managers left of their own volition, to, to put it mildly. So you just kind of become used to it, which is kind of sad to say that you would become used to that. but. Just thinking of myself as a small business owner, you don't really sit there and say, how am I supposed to react to this? Because all you do is like, we've been in one continuous veil of uncertainty for the last four plus years, and you just, I just see the uncertainty now continuing into the future, because you just don't know what's going to happen next. Johnny Ornalis has a comment for us. Um, Johnny Ornalis, El Mariachi, Johnny Ornalis, Guadalajara, JPA. Um, smart man. Smart man, Johnny Ornalis. Um, I feel that if, if the city is not able to find or even have a chief of police, in my mind, state police should step in and provide a service to our community and not be part of the political mess until council can get it straight, if that is all possible. That's an intriguing statement. Mm -hmm. Does Virginia State Police jump into the mix if the police department in Charlottesville is in such turmoil and in dysfunction? I think we still keep the autonomy and the power within the police department. Anywhere you want to go on any of no, these topics. I'm a big believer in, in federalism in the sense of you, I, I, I think most power that should impact our lives should be in a local level. And there should be even less as you go further out to the state and even less as you go out further out to the federal government. So the idea of, of outsourcing our police department to a higher level to me doesn't, does, doesn't automatically sound appealing. But my suspicion is I, I find it difficult to believe that we won't get there. 
look, I think they will be able to find somebody, whether it's the right person to fill the job. In other words, whether the best candidates would even want to take this job at this point, I think is debatable, but whether they will be able to find someone to take the job, I think will happen. I'll give some insight into the interim, interim police chief, Tito Durrett. Tito Durrett started working for the Charlottesville Police Department when he was 16 years old as a police explorer. He was then hired as a community service officer working in city parks during the summer before becoming a full-time employee. Tito Durrett graduated from the police academy at 21 years old and was the youngest officer ever hired by the Charlottesville Police Department. Tito Durrett is an African American and I believe um, one of the first to be major within the Charlottesville Police Department. Um, my friend, let me ask you a macro broad question. I asked this of Keith Smith earlier this morning. Does this turmoil impact our most prized possessions in our retirement, our wealth portfolios, home values? in any way. Mm. That's, that's difficult to say because I think there's just so much that goes into the value of home and, and a lot of that is supply and demand, right? So to the extent that this would reduce demand for homes, obviously that decreases home values. What we've seen over the past two years, I'd say, 2020, 2021, now I'm counting all of this year, is that there are just so many major supply and demand factors pushing up prices that it would have to be a very significant impact of this to push them back down. I mean, certainly, historically, when you see one of the, if I'm correct, some of the major reasons that people move um, in this country are safety and they are schools. Schools and safety are some of the major impacts in terms of people's decision on where to move, along with, I would say, um, um, cost of living in a place. So cost of living in Charlottesville has been high for a while. I don't, I don't foresee that changing. Neither do I. Um, the question is whether there's enough impact of safety and perception of safety, I should say, and school systems where people would say, oh, I don't want to move to Charlottesville or I want to move out of Charlottesville. It would have to be pretty significant to counteract the forces that are bringing so many more people to Charlottesville at this time and pushing up those high prices. I mean, we're seeing it. I mean, Sir Keith is seeing it, where there's just so much demand relative to supply. It's hard to see what to know what how how significant that would have to be to really change that equation. Daily Progress, Seville Weekly, NBC 29, Seville Tomorrow, CBS 19. I certainly hope and think that this should be the lead and focal points of your news broadcasts over an extended period of time this week in Central Virginia. Carol Thorpe has a number of good comments. Carol, we enjoy when you watch the program and offer perspective. I'll cherry pick a couple of these questions for you, Alex. We'll what, what do you make of an out of town DC PR firm being the foundation of Chip Boyle's editorial and the daily progress on why he fired Chief Brackney. Oh, you know, I, I'm one of those people that did, did. And then the second part of the question is, what do you make of him using his personal Gmail account as opposed to his work email account to communicate with this firm to about write, this? About the op-ed. Because the optics on that aren't great. The optics are not great. The optics... Never, it's funny, I, I think for the last 20 years, there's always every once in a while a new question of like someone's personal as opposed to government email account. And you, did, you would think that sooner or later people would wise up and realize that it's gonna come out eventually. Um, it just, it's, I think it is a question of optics. Is you always want to be, at least for me, as above board as possible. Doesn't mean everything needs to be public, right? There are deliberations that should happen in private Right, so that people can be free to voice their actual opinions. But when you're going to present something, for me as a writer, when you're going to present something as being your voice, you kind of do want it to be clear that it is your voice, that it hasn't been altered any way, that, that even if you got assistance from someone that's kind of disclosed, you know, and so just me being a writer, that's tend of where, kind of where I tend to lean on that. As when it comes to the use of 
which email, my suspicion is he had reached the point where this is a personal matter for him. It's no longer just in his capacity as city manager. I mean, this, is, this had become an issue of he himself and his personal reputation. And so it doesn't surprise me that he would want to keep those deliberations private. I'm not sure I, I necessarily fault him for that. More so than just me as a writer, I'd like to have the notion of when I present something as my voice, that it is my voice. I agree. Transparency is key, especially with local government. My friend, um, this is a crystal ball from you. You watch the shows. You're con informed and well-read. What do you think is going to happen this afternoon? It, just historically speaking, when I see things like this happen, it usually means someone will be forced to resign, is my suspicion. I'm not, can't know for certain, but, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna go to a sports analogy because that's where you mostly see this. When the doors all get closed in sports, it means the coach is gonna get fired, right? And if the coach resigns, it usually means he was fired. If the just coach resigns mid-season, it means he saw the writing on the wall. Exactly. I mean, or it means, let's face it, most resignations, I think, in today's day and age are, will you please resign? And they either say yes or no. And very few people in today's day and age end up saying, no, I demand that you fire me. I will not resign. Alex Erpe is the CEO of Emergent Financial Services. He's our guest on Tuesdays. His show today, Manana, airs Thursdays at 10.15 a.m. with the affable, the lovable, the intelligent Xavier Yerpe, the closer of Emergent Financial Hard Services. Hard to come on here and, be, and uh, beat that performance, Xavier, and, it was and on fire. was dead pop. Oh, dude, was I was getting teary-eyed. I, I was getting emotional. When Pop started referencing 9-11 and I could saw his raw emotion as a mm -hmm. firefighter um, in New York City, I felt it. It was tangible. It was palpable. I literally could feel it here. And then I started Absolutely. thinking my dad and getting emotional. Um, my friend, yesterday, WTI crude, which is, let's just cut to the, the chase, gas. Oil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. WTI crude doubled from pandemic lows. Pandemic lows. Oh, it's, it's at like a seven or eight year high. There we go. So um, I got Bloomberg open now. City says crude may hit 90 a barrel very soon. Which we haven't seen in a long time. 90 bucks a barrel, what happens? So I mean 90 bucks a barrel, you're going back to the basically $4 at the tank gasoline that you were talking about slightly earlier that we haven't seen Oh, I was paying decade? four bucks a gas during the recession. Yeah, uh, that's, that's what I was 2009, last time, 2009, 2010 yeah. is the last time we see that. And interestingly enough, 2009, 2010, we didn't exactly see a lot of inflation in the broader economy. Right? I would argue the inflation went into the stock market in those years rather than the hyperinflation that we had been expecting after all the money that was basically printed at that time. This time around, it seems slightly different because there seems to be enough of dislocations that this is passing through. And what I mean by that is your it, efficiency is looking like it's hard to come by. So shortage of truckers, shortage of means of transporting things, um, shortage of certain raw materials. So when you combine that with increasing gas prices, which make it more expensive to transport anything anywhere around the country, because we still mostly use trucks in this country to transport things. I mean, that's how things would get to Charlottesville. There's no direct way to get something here except via truck, which runs on gasoline. I mean, maybe diesel, but oil, basically. And so I think that impacts the underlying inflation of the economy. So we're gonna see the pain at the pump. We're probably gonna see people What's the second back. order effect? The second order effect is that people then reduce their spending in other places. In other words, what can you not there's, we always split this when we do financial planning into uh, non-discretionary expenses and discretionary. And what that just means is non-discretionary is what you have to have. In other words, you think of as a family, my roof over my head, whatever your rent or mortgage is, you have to pay it. There's no saying, I think I'm gonna cut back on my mortgage and live in half of a house. It doesn't work that way, you have to pay the mortgage. Gasoline, you have to get around. There's no saying, oh, I think I'm going to buy less shoes. No, you don't cut away your gas thing. You have to get to work. You have to take the kids to school. You have to spend what you need to spend on that. And then you did groceries as another example of something that you, you have to eat. Right? You can adjust it slightly, but there's no saying, I think I'm going to go without eating today. 
So those are what we call non-discretionary. And when the price of those goes up, when it becomes more expensive to do the basic things you need to survive, where do you cut back? You cut back on discretionary. So you cut back on eating out. You cut back on uh, personal clothing. You might cut back on just small enjoyable items, experiences, going to the movies. You'll cut back on things that you can cut back on because the things that you can't cut back on have risen in price and they're eating up a larger chunk of your budget, especially in today's age where the income is not changing. It's not like you can go and suddenly increase that side of your ledger. So you have to decrease the expenses where you can. So it is a definitely another headwind, I would say, um, against the fourth quarter. Not to say that we will have a bad one because it's, it's so tough to know with those crystal balls. You know, the, unfortunately, it's like the, um, the little Palantir in the Lord of the Rings. You look into it, but it's not super clear what you're seeing. Um, and I think the, the issue is that this is a headwind. You can definitely look at this and say this is not something that is pushing the economy to grow. It's something that is holding it back. Neil Williamson, the use of ghostwriters is not that unusual on a national stage, but on a local government level, it is unusual, but not unheard of, certainly unusual. Mm -hmm. Neil Williamson. Bill McChenzie, John Gruden was fired for 11-year-old emails. The head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders, mm -hmm. who had nasty things to say about the head of the Players Union and about Commissioner Roger Goodell 11 years ago, Alex Erpe. I don't think he was employed at he by was the working, NFL uh, at the time. I think he was still an ESPN analyst. He was a broadcaster. He That's was right. still a broadcaster yeah. uh, at that time. It is interesting that everything is recorded now. Everything has changed. And you know, it, it's, it's funny the world we live in because you know, just thinking back, you find out, you always know that there are characters out there who... I think back to old Yankees owner George Steinbrenner was one of them, that they could be the meanest of the mean when it came to in private doors. But if you think about it, there was no way of knowing what was said back in those days. I mean, if he was spouting his mouth off, insulting everybody to the kazoo, nobody's there recording his email and saying, hey, now I've got this on you, I can use this against you 10 years later. But it's, it's a different world today. You just have to be much more much more cautious about, because people say things in the heat of the moment, right, when they're upset that are not nice. Like, we're flawed, people are flawed, right? We make serious mistakes, we can be really mean to other people at times. And typically, you know, those things don't make it into the public arena, but in today's day and age, they can very easily, in an internet world, those things which you thought were you privately being less than charitable to other people are now you publicly being less than charitable to other people and it can cost you your job. Very well said. Evan Hansen, welcome to the broadcast. Questions for Alex Erpe coming in. This question's coming in from a regular watcher of the program. Grayson, we love when you ask questions. Jerry asks Alex the most vulnerable sectors for escalating gasoline prices. Ooh, that's a, that's a great question. So typically, if I'm thinking first order effects, it's going to be Typically, number one is vacations cut down. So if you're connected to vacation industry in any way, so you're thinking retail and hospitality, hotels, um, where else would you go? Restaurants, particularly restaurants along major highways where people would travel to go on vacation. Because if you always think about it, what people cut first is the travel. But as you're not going to spend gasoline to go on vacation and drive cross-country trips and go see places when that is the most, literally the most expensive part of your trip is not going to be traveling there. So it already hotels, retail hospitality, we're struggling. So I think that's probably first order because that's not a defensive sector. Whenever you have um, major economic impacts, right, there's two types of what I call like sectors out there. There's cyclical and there's defensive. Cyclical means that they go with the economy. In other words, when the economy is going well, they'll do well. When the economy is going poorly, they'll do poorly. So if you think of your cyclical sectors, hotels are one of them, restaurants are going to be one of them, um, probably tip, a lot of times luxury goods are going to be one of them. In other words, when people are feeling wealthy, you spend more. When you're feeling less wealthy, you cut back. And defensive, where you would want to look if you think things are going south, is to defensive sectors. And those are ones that either stand firm when there's an economic downturn, or ironically enough, may even do better. The classic example is the ramen noodles. 
you know those little cheap ones that you put in um, oh, yeah. soups and stuff. Ramen noodles are what they call one of those weird goods that when the economy is doing poorly, they do better because people stop buying other food and they start buying ramen noodles. So it's that classic defensive outlook where you sit there and say, people are going to purchase this and need this regardless of the economic situation around them. So it doesn't matter whether the economy is doing better or, or more poorly, they will still need these goods. So what you see is that the defensive sectors would outperform the cyclical ones when you're, and it's very easy to find these actually. You can, a lot of times if you go on Bloomberg and other sites, you can identify which, it'll identify for you which stocks are considered um, cyclical and which stocks and ETFs are considered defensive. And that's where you would look if you're thinking ahead and saying, all right, what do I do to defend or adjust when there are tailwinds? And again, I never, we never advocated emergent financial services just outright selling stuff. For us, it's always percentages. In other words, where do, where do I need to make my adjustment to say, do I want to be more defensive, less cyclical? Not do I want to be all defensive, no cyclical? Because if you're wrong, right, you want to be able to at least catch some of the economy suddenly rebounds in the fourth quarter for reasons that you and I sitting here can't see in our little crystal ball. You want to be prepared that at least you have some exposure to that upside. Um, here's an interesting question um, that's come in from an uh, often viewer of the program. This is from Lauren. She asks, what is the impact of escalating oil and gasoline on a University of Virginia? Ooh, that's a great that's a great question. I, I mean, I would imagine some of the universities, a good part of the university expenses must in some way be tied to that. Because, I mean, even if I'm thinking about it, just I'm, I'm pretty sure all of their um, food services are run by Aramark, or at least connected in some way. They have to bring in their trucks. I've seen Aramark. When I used to go to UVA, I would see the Aramark trucks. Absolutely. By. Me too. Um, that's going to become an, an increased cost. Um, for the students, just thinking back to my days as a student, do you use mostly, for UVA, you use mostly uh, the public transportation because there's no parking sure, on grounds. Sure. So I, I think that'll be more limited, but I can see some basic expenses for the university increasing. Tough to know what would happen on the other side, but I think once the students are here, they tend to, at least from my experience, you tend to take as much of the, the bus lines as you can. I used to do the yellow line I used to take. I think um, where it could impact the University of Virginia, and Lauren, thank you for the question, is what he touched on earlier. Um, increase oil and gas means restaurants are going to raise menu prices, which means students have less disposable income to potentially spend in mm -hmm. ecosystems like the corner, midtown, the downtown mall. Uh, students, even though they have mommy and daddy's credit card, are still on a relatively fixed budget mm -hmm. because it just takes a phone call from dad or mom to say, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> are you doing? Stop spending this money <laughs> on beers and, and food. How yeah, if you were my dad, there was no way I was on his credit card. He was like, you're not touching this. Yeah, if if, if this my dad, my <laughs> mom, I wasn't on the credit card either, hence the uh, busboy and waiter and host <laughs> position at Ruby Tuesdays and Barracks Road for me. Um, so I think that's one way, Lauren, to answer your question. We, we are fortunate to have the university here. I don't think we should take it for granted, and it's certainly not insulated from macro oh, no. KPIs. Oh, no. It's, it, it, the university, even though, let's face it, it, is, it, you, it has to run as a business in some way. And what I mean by that is it is impacted by the same things which impact businesses, which is how much money am I taking in and how much money am I putting out. And granted, there are different calculations because obviously you get some money from the state, but the, there's a taking in and a putting out that is going to affect the way UV run, UVA runs. And it is, we do have to take in track that it's not, it's not something that is just appears and will always run the way it does now. It is, it is a part of the community that is going to go through good times and bad times just like the rest of us, right? And so we can't, like you said, we can't take it for granted just assume that things will always be as they are now. Bill McChenzie, ambulances, UVA buses, police, um, as ways that the university is going to be mm -hmm. impacted. This question is coming up. Alex, your take on 49,000 plus square feet in a big time firm leasing the space in the 323 building by Garrett Square. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. I did. Well, I was listening to you at, talking about it, uh, that news. It's, I mean, it's following the trend we're seeing, which is um, Charlottesville more as a tech place. What I mean by that is off, large office space being rented out by a single company that comes in, either brings in, and they seem to be bringing in a lot of 
people as opposed to a manufacturing where you build uh, something out in Albemarle County somewhere and you start then hiring a bunch of people from the community to fill it. And I think my, my concern with that, like you obviously want the economic growth that comes with that, but is that growth you hope will translate into per capita growth, which is always my, my concern with this kind of growth because we focus a lot on economic growth. And economic growth is a good thing, but when only for me, the key is that it has to translate into per capita growth. And what that means is growth per person or per family, as you want to think about it. Because if you, if you think about it, if you double the size of Charlottesville's economy, and you double the amount of people in Charlottesville, per capita, no one's better off, right? So the average family is in the exact same place they were before. Because yes, there's twice as much economy to go around. The GDP is twice as big, right? But there's twice as many people there. So what you want is that number to be slightly different. In other words, you want the growth to be greater than the increase in population. Because when that happens, you're seeing per capita growth. That means the people living here, the small business owners that are already here, the families that are already here, are now seeing increased growth in their own families, economically speaking, because of the the wealth that's being spread around. In other words, people buying, people selling, the transactions that are going on. You, you want that kind of economic growth. So to the extent that companies like this coming in provide more growth, I think that's a good thing. The question is how much of that growth is going to then come to the rest of the economy, to the people already here, versus just be absorbed by people that are brought in from elsewhere. Because if all you're doing is, is keeping the same pace, then you'll sit here and say, you know, 10 years from now, ah, oh, the GDP of Charlottesville doubled. And then I'll sit there and say, the number of people in Charlottesville also doubled, so everyone's in the same boat that they were 10 years ago. And that's not what you want. You want people to be in a better situation in 10 years. And what's your prediction? It is, I, my suspicion is that it's not as great as it could be, but I suspect that there will probably be more per capita growth as a result of it. Probably not... In other words, not the level of protrapative growth that you would want, considering they, they tend to bring in, the tech companies tend to bring in other people, which then push up prices, and that's adding to the population. But I suspect that the spending they will do here um, will benefit per capita as well, is my suspicion. Judah Wickhauer is about to get a picture of you. Is this a new shirt you're wearing? Oh, it is. I mean, I've worn it, I've been on Today Manana a couple times, but it's, Thanks to, uh, my mom has always great taste. Mrs. Erpy, you have my fantastic taste. taste, Mrs. Erpy. I hope you're watching, Mrs. Erpy. I would love to meet you one day. Um, Judah Wickhauer is going to get a pic of the Antonio Banderas of the Erpy right. family. Um, <laughs> Alex Erpy right here. And as you're getting, as you're smiling for Judah in this camera, this will be the cover photo of the package today. I'm going to close with this question for you before we let you go. My friend, today, Imanyana, 10, 15 a.m. on Thursday a.m., on Thursday, 10, 15 a.m. on this network, um, what do we have in, play, in store? It's going to be a lot of fun on yeah. Thursday. So first, we're going to have uh, Rob Campbell. Mm -hmm. He's the general manager, and Don Whittaker, the cider maker for Castle Hill Cidery, uh, are going to join us. They're going to talk about, I think they have some, a new cider that's made. I think they're the first one in the country to make a new cider in like buried clay pots. That they're, that they're attempting this. So they're going to come on and join us. And then in the second part of the show, uh, Michael Lamont, the genius, cocktail mixologist. The, the, yes, the cocktail mixologist, Nick Colson, bartender extraordinaire um, at the Alley Light, is going to join us. Fantastic place, and he's a, he's a fun interview. guy. That's he's a good a interview. Fun guy. So we're going to have uh, all three of them uh, joining us on today, manana, this Thursday. I hope you encourage them to make some cocktails on air. Oh, I will. I will and tell the peanut that. gallery hopefully can get some of those cocktails <laughs> along go. with the closer and Antonio Banderas as well. We love we when that happens. We have the raw materials. We do. We do have the raw materials. <laughs> uh, you are A. Plus. Um, wish you the best. I'm excited for Thursday at 10 15 a.m. today, Imanyana, presented and powered by? By Emergent Financial Services, Tristel Noel State Farm Agency. We've got GBS Financial Services, Vitae Spirits. And our newest sponsor is uh, Seville Picnic. Seville Picnic. You guys that are crushing it. Us. Today, Mignana, guys. The Erpy family, absolutely fantastic. Had two um, doses and dips of the Erpy family, two generations today. Your father and the firstborn right there. Not an overload? I know. I thought it was great. <laughs> I, you know I love you guys. I know. I'm just messing I, with I you. I love you guys. I wish you the best. You have Same a good here. afternoon, my friend. Same um, J-Dubs, if you want to go on the one shot here, a couple of items that I want to get out of the notebook here as you go to the one shot. Um, we'll follow what happens today at 3 o'clock very closely.
We'll follow today what happens at 3 o'clock closely and with an eye of a community steward and a stakeholder of the community. Have a good one. Good to see you. We will undoubtedly cover this topic tomorrow on the program. I think if we're in a position of, of needing a new city manager, an interim, interim, interim city manager, Mike Murphy and Dave Norris come immediately to mind. Mike Murphy and Dave Norris immediately to mind. I'm ready for local government to be consistent, stable, and in the background. I'm tired of local government being synonymous with the Loch Ness monster at Bush Gardens, a roller coaster ride. I think we all are. Like a referee in a football game, the zebras, the men in stripes, are not the story of the game. The counselors are not the story of the municipality. The citizens, the people, the community, and the businesses are the story of the municipality. I'm tired of the story being the counselors and divisive and dysfunction exhausted beyond belief with it. We have good news. We have a new show that's coming to the I Love Seville Network Wednesdays at 10, 15 a.m. Details to come. This show will be hosted by a local and living legend of tremendous proportions. A name and a brand that's recognized and familiar, not only from the I Love Seville Network, but for a number of different circles within this community. More details to come later this week of the newest show we're gonna air Wednesdays at 10, 15 a.m. on the I Love Seville Network that now will have more local programming. Frankly speaking, we already do than any other media outlet in town. For Wednesday's new show at 10.15 a.m. will take this network to over 25 hours a week of programming that's localized, personalized, humanized for you, the Central Virginian. My name is Jerry Miller, and this is the I Love Seville Show. Have a good afternoon.